We have the pleasure of welcoming Dan Pontefract today to our interview series Leaders Hum. I'm Ashwara Jain from the People Hum team. Before we begin, just a quick intro of People Hum. People Hum is an end-to-end, one-view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work with AI and automation technologies. We run the People Hum blog and video channel which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Dan Pontefract is the founder of the Pontefract Group. He's a very well-known keynote speaker and author of the best-selling book Open to Think, which was the 2019 Get Abstract International Book of the Year and the Axiom Business Book Silver Medal for Leadership in 2019. He's also a writer for Forbes and Harvard Business Review. Dan helps build bridges between life and work through his activities and we are happy to have him on our interview series. Welcome Dan, we're thrilled to have you. Ms. Jane, thank you so much for having me today. Happy beginning of the Monday week during an epically sad period of the pandemic, but I like to see your smiling face. <laughs> Our pleasure, Dan. Our pleasure. So, Dan, tell us a little about the Pontefract Group. What was your vision to start something like this? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, in essence, I figured that I had better leave the corporate world to help more than one organization at a time with what I felt to be sort of a lifelong career of culture change, of purpose, of flexible work, funny enough, in a time like the pandemic that's coming in handy, uh, as well as, you know, different ways in which to learn uh, as opposed to just face to face. So ostensibly, being in the corporate world and the academic world for about 25 years, I said, you know what, I'm 48. I think it's time to help other organizations than just one. And uh, if you could, you know, tell us what exactly do you help organizations with? Well, I guess I'm kind of flexible, but ultimately I do four things. So one is, as you mentioned, I could deliver a keynote and sort of help uh, an organization with an event or how they uh, need to educate, if you will, like, you know, attendees of their employees, what have you. Uh, but really uh, where I'm probably more useful or, the, or where I provide the best value is when I'm inside the organization and actually helping them shift. So that can come in three ways. One is I like to go into organizations uh, who let me and conduct what I call a culture assessment. Uh -huh. And a culture assessment takes between three to four months, but it's uh, a chance for me to interview uh, executives, to have focus groups with team members, uh, to survey, to kind of walk the floor, if you will, and, and really understand what's going on. And there's always great things that are happening and not so great things. And so the difference between the two is sort of the recommendation on how that organization may want to change how they do whatever it is that they do. So that's culture assessment. Uh, the second thing I do is I kind of help with modeling. So modeling may be leadership models. It may be learning models. It may be organizational design, sort of helping the organization see how it might become more effective with who reports to whom or what teams are sort of ineffective or effective. So the whole kind of modeling work, uh, which is a consulting opportunity, brings my experience again to the forefront of, well, how do we do things around here and how might we do things differently? And then the third one are uh, essentially workshops and coaching. So are there ways for me to come in and to provide you know, a, an intact team with particular skill development? And you know, maybe that's like how to think differently. Maybe that's how to drive purpose differently, but also on a one-on-one -on -one coaching exchange, I'll do that as well. So essentially that's what I do. I do keynotes, then I do culture assessments, modeling, and then kind of workshop slash coaching facilitation. You know, I get to work with government and public sector at a, at a federal or national level, plus provincial and state level or municipality right at the city level. Uh, I can work with a small, medium-sized organization, you know, 500 employees, um, or I can work with, you know, a bank that has, you know, 250,000 employees. 
Um, and they're all different um, for sure. And I, and I, I get a lot of, I get a lot of uh, self-satisfaction and reward out of working with those organizations because they're different. But I'll tell you this, uh, the problems are typically the same. The, uh, it always comes down to people. It always comes down to people. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it, it's, uh, I think now, now it's the norm that, you know, businesses are shifting from being very business centric to really people centric. And suddenly, you know, they're all about the people and the people are our assets, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and you did mention that you take a, take cultural assessment tests, right? So, uh, what is it that you're really looking for and what is, what are your findings out of those, you know, from all of these assessments that you made? Well, um, essentially when I'm hired in to do a culture assessment, the organization, and it's typically either, you know, the CEO or the COO or the CHRO and sometimes the CIO, but they're, they're basically recognizing that um, whilst they've probably done a pretty good job thus far, they want to sort of elevate their game a little more. They want to find ways in which to improve their engagement, improve their productivity, maybe improve their innovation. Uh, and if you kind of look to the current day with uh, the pandemic, they may want to change the way in which that they actually function, how they do the work, and particularly where they do the work. And so my role in those cases are kind of coming in and saying, okay, well, here's, here's where your culture is. You know, you're doing great things over here with, let's say, performance development, or you're doing not so great things over here with, say, recognition. So you're not recognizing your people at all, or you may be you know, you give them a pin for being there for five years, like who cares, right? And then there's all the other kind of people and culture um, pieces or attributes that fall in, in that. So there's leadership, there's learning, you know, there's, there's collaboration or the lack of it. There's organizational design and how they might be too hierarchical and maybe they need to be a little flatter, um, maybe paying homage to my first book, perhaps, Flat Army, all of that, right? And, and then it's like, okay, Here's here again, here are some good things that are going on, but you know, this is you may have teams that are doing none of it, and you may have teams that are doing all of it. And so there's disparity throughout an organization. I find it fascinating. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example, and I won't I won't share what organization it is because that's obviously wrong. But uh, there's this organization, there are 1,500 uh, people that work in, in the group, and they're based uh, across an entire province. And you have basically, you know, let's say 800 people that work in a headquarters and 800 people that work in offices throughout the, the rest of the province. The, the culture of the 800 people that don't work at headquarters is vastly different and better than the headquarter culture. The headquarter culture is one very hierarchical, uh, very... Um, like competitive with one another um, and not very collaborative, even though they're face to face. Whereas the folks who are kind of in the field sat, splattered across a province, they are um, collegial and they're proactive and they're a little more community driven and they're a little more helping out one another, right? Little, way more collaborative. And, and sort of bringing this to the attention of that organization, right? After kind of going through interviews and looking at the organization, they're like, wow, we didn't know that. We couldn't figure out. We, so we're the headquarter goofballs. So we're like, yeah, you're the headquarter goofballs, right? <laughs> so it's that where, you know, on the surface, you look at a website, you look at what they do. It's like, you know, company X, great. But then when you look behind the scenes, they could be so much more productive and efficient and customer friendly if they sorted out how uh, they operate between headquarters and the field. And so they're, they're in the middle of kind of switching how they do that and, and some progress being made. But, you know, it gives me a great opportunity to learn from that different dynamic. And now I have that example in my sort of repertoire and I can draw upon that next time I go to another organization. Absolutely. And do you attribute this culture gap to mainly leadership or is it something else? 
Well, it's mostly leadership. I think every uh, human problem is a human problem, i.e. problems caused by humans. But um, what I find is that leaders do a few things strangely. Um, one is they, they ignore the employee, you know, and it's, there's this kind of saying, oh, you're just a number where basically, you know, one of my most loathed terms is headcount, where you're, you're just a number, you're a headcount in a spreadsheet and they don't, they forget or they lose sight of the fact that the employee is still a human, that they have emotions, that they have needs that they have problems at home, that their kids are having difficulty at school, that it's a long commute, that, um, you know, there's real societal issues. And when a leader forgets about the humanity or the humaneness that's needed to deliver leadership to the team, you know, that's when I see a lot of issues happen because then the team looks up and like, oh, she or he doesn't care about me. They're only in it for themselves, right? And why would I want to work hard or innovate or create or whatever with, with that person? So they, they check out. Or worse, you know, they go against, you know, the orders of the team and they're, they're literally doing things that are probably uh, ill-advised, but they're angry. So they're, they're kind of entering into spite, and a spite world uh, as opposed to you know a collective good world so i see that um but again there's lots of good stories where when the leaders kind of check their ego at the door when they realize that this uh, the sum of all is greater than the individual parts separately that they tap into the collective intelligence of the team that they reward the team that they uh, develop and, and learn with the team that they're not the leader at the front, but they're the leader from behind. And they're, they're kind of first one in, but last one out, if you will. You know, they're there to help break down barriers, to provide air cover, to think about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, right? Like thinking about the whole of what makes a team operate. It is, we are all different, but we're all can be collective one if that leader creates a culture that allows that to manifest. And, you know, three out of 10 times, that's how it is happening. But the other seven out of 10 times, it's not. It's, uh, it's frightening. I just finished writing a book, right, like spot on with that, that sentiment. And the book is called Lead, Care, Win, How to Become a Leader Who Matters. And the, the point of lead, care, win is not about winning per se. It's that when you lead by caring, you will win the team over. You will win the customer over. And that's the outcome we're looking for is to kind of win, but not in a money or I'm first sense. It's on the engagement and the culture and the love uh, of humanity sense. That's what I'm getting at at lead, care, win. And, and you're right about empathy. Um, that's chapter number one. It's actually called Be Relatable. And when you're relatable, uh, amongst other attributes, you are demonstrating empathy. But I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on a kind of spoiler alert. We get empathy wrong because we don't realize that there are three types of empathy. Like there's the word empathy, and, and generally speaking, as, a, as a, an umbrella term, it's fantastic. But the three types of empathy break down into what I call head, heart, and hands. So the head is cognitive empathy. That's when you can intellectually think about what someone is thinking. So they may be frightened. Uh, they may be thinking differently. Uh, they may have uh, thoughts on something that you hadn't thought about before. That's cognitive empathy. You're putting your head in their head. What are they thinking about? And then on the heart, that's called um, emotional empathy. And emotional empathy is when you're feeling what they're feeling. So they could be feeling down or sad or happy or um, like scared of something. There's just a, a feeling. And so now you're in their shoes of their feeling. So you're kind of sensing their heart. And then the third type, uh, which I use my hands to describe that one metaphorically, is called sympathetic empathy. 
And sympathetic empathy is when you've uh, intellectualized how they're thinking and you've got a sense of how they're feeling with their heart that you're going to do something about it. So you can take action. And when you take action, you're sympathizing with their head and their heart, with your hands, so to say. So you're, you're doing something about it. And when you do all three, it's a wonderful um, birth to compassion. And when we're compassionate about that individual, we are now taking into consideration all factors, their ethnicity, right? Their gender, uh, their schooling, their places of work beforehand, the pressures at home, uh, the pressures of the job, right? They just lost their mom, whatever the situation, all of that compassion is now born because you as a leader have thought through the three types of empathy. And that's how we can be more relatable. When we're relatable to the employee, then that employee ultimately goes further and farther for you as the leader. Whereas the, the irony, of course, right, has been leaders think they need to tell their team what to do, uh, to whip them with a, with a leather lash, right? Say, come on, faster, 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 get going, right? But we're not horses, right? We're not bulls, we're people. And bulls and horses are not people, so people need the opposite. We need to relate to the head, heart, and then ultimately take action with the hand. You see like Hallmark cards and you see Instagram memes that says there's no I in team. I mean, there's a reason that joke has been around forever, but what, what ultimately happens is the other metaphor I like to use is, you know, uh, let's say cricket or football, soccer, right? You have the player's crest or the team's crest, right, on the front, somewhere on the lapel or somewhere on the front. It's like, you know, it's Manchester United, right? There's the crest on the front. But on the back is a number and their name. So Marcus Rashford, let's say, you know, number 10 Rashford on the back there. Well, does Marcus Rashford, the football player, play just for Marcus Rashford or does he play for the team? And my argument is that if he only played for himself, he wouldn't be on the team. He would be looked at by his coach, his manager, his team members as a selfish player. And so what Rashford has to do for Manchester United is he needs to play for the crest of Man United. And that means playing with and for and through and about all the team members, the coaching staff, the training staff, the physiotherapists, the doctors, management, the executives, that's the team. So now play that into the organizations today. If a leader does not see that she or he has a team of which they are leading, then they're only playing for the name on the back of their own kind of jersey. They're only playing, that would be me playing just for Pontifrac on the back, not whatever my company logo is, my organization logo is on the front. And that's what I see far too often is that leaders are playing for the name on the back of their jersey only. So they're interested in, um, salary increases or stocks or raising the share price or whatever it takes to increase revenues and to eliminate costs or to increase profitability. You know, all of that, like profitability and revenue, et cetera, comes as an outcome of an engaged, motivated, relatable team, not the other way around. Absolutely. So it's, it's the leader's job to keep a team engaged and not just play for himself, but act as a coach and, you know, build that team experience, right? And it, it's about a higher value purpose, not just a very individualistic or a selfish purpose, right? It's exactly it. I mean, if leaders only knew and decided to move from selfishness to selflessness, then you got yourself a pretty good game. Then I would be out of business because then every leader is acting with a selfless sense of character and a purpose, not a selfish sense of character or purpose. 
And, and once you start figuring that out, again, the team is just, you know, amazingly going to go to bat or further for you. So I'll give you an example recently with the pandemic. So uh, I checked in on one of my clients, you know, and I said, hey, Robert, you know, how you doing? You know, how are things? And he told me this story. Um, he's a director of a team, 15 or so people. And, and Robert says, he tells me the story where, you know, everyone was asked to work from home, uh, but no one wanted to go back into the office of his team because they were frightened about the virus uh, to get their PC because they didn't have laptops. They had PCs um, and their stuff, right? And they're a bunch of accountants. So they got files and papers and things that they needed. So the organization made a decision to send everyone home, but they didn't really necessarily think through, you know, all the steps to get everybody from home. So Robert, instead of saying, I, I want you all to go into the office and go get your stuff. He, he said, don't worry, I've got your back. And so he went into the office and he collected their PC, their files and their ergonomic chair put it into his truck and he drove to everybody's home, whether they're in a condo, a flat or a house, phoned them up and said, Hey, I'm here. Uh, I've wiped down everything with isopropyl alcohol so that, you know, there's no remnants potentially of any virus whatsoever. Uh, the stuff is sitting at your door or in the hallway, the front lobby, uh, come get it. And I'm going back to do the next team member. Wow. Yeah. So it wasn't to, he didn't tell them to go get their stuff and he didn't say, okay, figure it out. You know, I'm not doing anything for you. He was compassionate. He was empathic and he did what I would hope that many leaders do, which is thinking about the employee's feelings first and then doing something about it. Like that's leadership to me. Absolutely. That is, that is strong leadership. And, um, you know, that is, that, that's something that any employee will always, always remember and, you know, kind of keep that person in mind, even though they might've left the company, uh, after, after some time, right. You always remember such leaders and tell me something, Dan, you know, do you think that tools and tech can help in this? Do they play a role as an enabler to kind of build out, uh, you know, a good leadership plus an employee experience? Uh, yes and no. So I have this sort of line um, I say often, behavior before tools and form before function. So behavior before tools, form before function, what does that mean? Well, behavior and form are the attributes, they're the ways in which that you react uh, whether you're proactive, compassionate, open, transparent, authentic, trustworthy, you know, you name it. Those are all behaviors of relatability, behaviors of collaboration, behaviors of being humane. And no technology is going to teach you that. No technology is actually going to fix your errors. In fact, if you are not trustworthy, and uncollaborative and inauthentic, the technology only exacerbates your deficiencies. And so if you are not, you know, for example, around the office saying, hey, how you doing today? Are you okay? Or around the office saying, hey, I've got a file for you. I thought you maybe use, you might need this for a client or a customer call or whatever. Or, hey, can I get you a coffee? Like, you look like you're overworked today. Might, might I go get you a tea? If you don't do that face to face, the technology is not going to help you because now you're even further removed from the face to face arena and technology is like what? Because you're going to send some sort of, uh, I don't know, like cat playing piano on Instagram video to, to them to make them laugh. That's not enough, right? It's just, it looks weird. So, so there's that, but that being said, um, there are some instances of technology, if you have the behavior down, that certainly will demonstrate continued in, like behavior, like continued positive behavior. So 
um, uh, <laughs> funny enough, this the same individual who uh, who went and got the desks or the the chairs and the PCs and all the files, the accountants. So it was his birthday uh, last week. So that that story happened like three weeks ago. So last week it's his birthday, and and he's he's at home. And, and so he, he sets up, uh, he sets up a zoom call with the team and he says, look, uh, he's a single guy. So he's, uh, <laughs> so he's like, you know what? I, I want to celebrate my birthday. It's a big birthday. So he's having a certain number on the, on the calendar. And, uh, so he gets the people around the zoom call and he says, look, I want you to teach me how to make a cake from scratch. And so he's got his laptop in his kitchen. He's got, you know, the 14 odd people in their Zoom hats, right? Whatever. And they're teaching him over like a two hour period how to make a cake from scratch um, so that he could celebrate his birthday and that his team sort of helped him. Now, that story is interesting because the same guy, as I mentioned, right, with going to get the chairs and whatever. But they're using technology just to kind of continue and accentuate who this leader is. A very open, charismatic, down to earth, you know, no hierarchy. Hey, I don't know how to make a cake. You guys want to help me out here? And, and they did. And he made the cake and, you know, you took photos of him eating the cake and you sent it out with the team, you know, the next day. That's what I'm getting at. Like, we don't, we, we don't have to be so um rigid as a leader we can be humane and when you are a humane leader the technology actually can help but my point to your question is it doesn't mask anything you can't use it if you're not already thinking about how to be a more human type of leader i'll give you an example right so uh i got a a, a director um sort of contacted me and this is before the pandemic, about how his boss, uh, VP, would text like orders, like, I want you to do this, it would be text, or you didn't do this well, and it would be text. So it's just like these streams of consciousness through text and very, almost like violent type of text, right? Like they were not compassionate, they were directive, they were lacking any couth they were they were horrible like i saw a couple of them and so he was looking for advice on you know what he should do and i said well you got to meet face to face and just tell him how you're feeling because it's impacting your productivity and that's really what the vp should be thinking about is when you do this it's doing the opposite right it's like all of a sudden this guy's like geez i just i've been i've been ridiculed by you know the the text or I've been um, asked to do something that's wrong or whatever, right? The feedback is like so negative. It's making me feel negative and down. Yeah. So he did eventually have a conversation with the VP to ask him to not lead by texting. And again, some leaders who think technology is easier, as to my point earlier, are exactly exacerbating the negative leadership that they actually already demonstrate they're just they're it's exploding in a more negative way because they're using it uh, even even worse and you know do, are you a believer of the gig economy and you know have you seen the adoption of the gig economy over time and have you seen the increase in you know the millennial workforce and how do you think this trend is relevant with respect to the future of work well a couple of thoughts uh i think you know mainstream media they've sort of hijacked the term the gig economy people have had part-time jobs forever like it's not new um so there's that but where i do take uh umbrage and concern my concerns lie with the so-called gig economy is is the mentality shift so when we used to have part-time jobs uh, and maybe say two part-time jobs or three part-time jobs, often there would be someone within the two or three jobs that would be looking at benefits. You know, there would be, you know, if you got to 50% part-time job, you'd have benefits or 60% load, right? Now 
these days, one of the things that's really falling by the wayside is our benefits, where organizations look to cut costs, so they employ gig economy employees, and, and they only get them up to a certain threshold of hours, so they don't have to pay benefits. And I, and I think that's just wrong. I, I mean, that goes back to why are we here? Is the organization here solely to make money and, and profit? and to up the share price because some of those gig economy type decisions of hiring are based on the fact that, well, it's cheaper to not hire a full-time employee. You don't have to pay them benefits. You don't have to pay them salary increases every year. And it's, you know, we know that depending on where you live, that the benefit package can be, you know, upwards of 35% more on top of the salary. So that, that kind of frightens me a little bit. Um, to be honest. And then there's the, well, they don't really work for us, so we don't really have to care about them mentality. And what I mean by that is uh, the employer sort of suggesting to the employee who's the gig economy employee, the part-time kind of worker, the contractor, you're just a number. You know, we can get someone else. You're replaceable. And whether you're a Lyft or an Uber driver or you know, whatever the case may be, you're, this whole notion that the employer can hold the, the, the baton to whack someone and say, look, well, there's someone else right there. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't create a great culture because if your organization is made up of, you know, so-called, the so-called gig economy employees and full-time employees, the full-time employees still are working with the gig economy employees. Do they want to work in an organization that treats the gig economy employees differently and less than humane, that, that frightens me dearly. Do you think that'll change after the pandemic is over? Would we be more inclusive as organizations? That's a great question. Um, what, I, what, I, what I think is gonna happen is, yes, there's gonna be a short-term boost to being inclusive and patient and we're all in this together. I think there's also going to be a short-term boost to organizations thinking about how they serve their community, so their direct community. And yes, the multinationals have to look at things on a global level, whether you are Amazon or Walmart or Unilever or McDonald's or Coca-Cola. You know, that, that's a different story, but I think a lot of organizations and community will be looking to the community now, hey, how can we help each other? You know, how can we keep the local merchant, the restaurant, the shop up and running rather than having them go away? I, I do see that happening. What, what I worry about in a more longer term sense is the return to those sort of diabolical behaviors of profit first, um, at all costs and, 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 and executives in particular, just ignoring the fact that the pandemic happened and it happened, uh, to all of us. And that it showed that we are all, whether you're in India or Australia or Canada, we're all the same. We're humans. So why don't we operate with that humanity? I worry about that. I do. Case in point, Gartner did a study last week with CFOs across uh, the planet, 3,000 CFOs, and, and 5% of the CFOs said that they were going to now think about a more flexible work program, right, for their employees. And, and I was like, only 5%? <laughs> you could, like we just went through everyone working from home and we're proving with some bumps that we can do it and the cfos there's only five percent of them that said yeah we we think that this would be a good idea we're going to do more work from home things going forward so so far they're not quite you know <laughs> reading the tarot cards all that well <laughs> yeah it's it's kind of messed up right i mean we just don't know what we're going to expect and it's just kind of trying to swim in the shark pond, but really, you know, 
I think CXOs are, are just in a fix and they're perplexed by the situation. They just don't know how to handle this. They never saw this coming. You know, um, about 12 years ago, uh, I was working for a telecommunications company as its chief learning officer. And I got, I got wind of a story from a vice president in the finance team uh, who during the 08, 09 economic meltdown, if you remember that one, um, everybody was sort of tasked with a number to bring down the budget because revenues were falling. So every vice president across the organization said, look, please bring down your budget by whatever, 100,000, a million, whatever the case was. And as we both know, um, you know, the largest expense in any organization is people, right? Their salaries. So this particular vice president got the number and instead of making a unilateral decision by himself, went to the entire team and said, look, I've got, I've got this problem. You know, I've been asked to reduce the budget by X amount and I need your help because I don't think I have all the ideas and I think you probably have better ideas than mine anyway. And so they spent a couple of days like working through what the possibilities would be for them to reach, you know, the number that was issued to them by the CFO. And through that consultative, open, transparent, authentic, humane discussion, the team ultimately came up with the ideas that were put forward, which included some early retirements. People were happy to sort of say, yeah, I'm out of here, which included some job sharing for the short term. So people reduced their salaries by a percentage, but then, you know, they did a way in which that they could kind of still keep their benefits and their full-time kind of employment for a period of time. It was part-time. And then later on, when things got better, they would come back. And, and a couple other things that they decided to do, right? Some training costs and whatever. And the VP, you know, and I tell the story and I asked him about it, you know, he was like, well, it was just the right thing to do. You engage and explore with your team first before you go and execute and make a decision. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I'm talking about. If you can do that, then you are a leader that gets it. Uh, even though you might have the VP title, it doesn't mean that you're playing just for the name on the back of the jersey. You play for the team. Well, I was going to say, finally, like the buck still has to stop with the leader. So you may employ a fair process. It may not be a fair outcome to your liking, but at least you were involved. Right. And, and that's really what every leader's duty, I think, is. It's a duty of care. Involve your people, but you still got to make the decision. And it may not be liked by everyone, but at least they were part of it. Yeah, and you did the right thing. So your conscience is clear. You know, you did the right thing. Yeah. Absolutely. There you go. <laughs> Well, um, just for the last leg of the interview, Dan, if you have any other important sound bites that you'd like to leave for our viewers? Uh, I'll leave it with this, my uh, purpose statement. So long ago, I was climbing up and down a mountain uh, doing kind of a daily, uh, I guess, athletic slash health kind of thing where I was getting back into shape uh, after an injury. And it was in Vancouver, a mountain called Grouse Mountain. So it's like 1.8 kilometers up and uh, a lot of fun. Anyway, I was, I was massaging and, and marinating with some words. I didn't think I had, you know, what I originally was calling a mission statement, but I turned it into what I call my declaration of purpose. And so that's kind of formed my thinking and my decision making and my habits and behaviors ever since. And the, the purpose statement is this. We're not here to see through each other. We're here to see each other through. And very Gandhi-like, actually, in my opinion. But it's, it's a, we're, why are we here? Like, if we're at each other's throats, if we're pushing back all the time, if we're just in it for me, how are we here to see each other through? We're not. So, you know, for 20-odd years now, I've been kind of, um, operating with that in mind. And that's why I don't mind giving away toolkits for remote leadership and giving away toolkits for working from home employees and doing things like free virtual conferences for anyone. Because I, I know that eventually someone sees the good and says, okay, can we hire you now? <laughs> 
it's that, yeah, sure, let's, let's help you out. Um, I just, I don't know, I wish more people would worry less about the money and more about the humanity and know that eventually, anyway, people, people have to earn a living. It doesn't have to be the other way around. Absolutely. I think money is a consequence. You just have to, you know, really do what you think is right, follow your passion, help people, uh, you know, you really create something that's, that goes beyond yourself, you know, create something yeah. that is a high order value and you'd be known for your work and not for uh, the fame and fortune that you've collected. And that's an amazing thought. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dan. I had a really wonderful conversation with you. I know we're kind of like short on time. I could really go on and we could converse a lot more. Uh, maybe do like a sequel of this interview. I don't know. But I had like, I had a lot of fun talking to you. And thank you so much. I appreciate your time and, uh, you know, you sharing your views with us. Uh, I will, I will really stay in touch with you. Awesome. Well, thank you for the time, the opportunity. And really enjoyed our chat it's a uh, it's a privilege to be able to share my thoughts and i hope that this helped at least one person out there absolutely it, it definitely will it helped me so i'm pretty sure that it'll help a lot of people <laughs> awesome well stay safe stay safe dan <laughs>